War is a political clash of wills, the continuation of state policy by other means, to misquote the dead Prussian. The shooty-shooty, bang-bang side of things is largely a left-brain activity, logical, analytical, procedural. But at the very highest levels of command, a bit of right-brain creativity and magic is exactly what's required. It's called operational art and is best described by T.E. Lawrence, he of Arabia fame. Nine-tenths of tactics are certain and taught in books, he said. But the irrational tenth is like the kingfisher flashing across the pool. And that is the test of generals. Operational art is a military activity conducted by a commander who then directs his or her staff to explore specific ideas. It starts once the political leadership has decided quite why the military lever of national power is to be employed. This is expressed in what is known as the end state, which should describe the military situation that is required to make possible the desired political outcome. Once the commander knows this end state, he or she will then know what's expected of them and where the limits are. That last bit is important. Even if the political and military leadership are in alignment, identifying the end state is tricky. Look at Ukraine. Is shoving Russian forces back to the lines of February the 23rd last year good enough? It's arguably an easier task for the military than ejecting them from the whole country. But will that only store up problems for the future? Is it domestically acceptable? Look at another example. Coalition forces went into Afghanistan after 9-11 to destroy Al-Qaeda and make sure the place couldn't be used as a sanctuary by those wishing to attack the US and the West. That objective was achieved in about three months. But then the end state, if one had ever really been identified and agreed upon in the first place, changed and became something about shaping the political landscape, transforming the economy and changing society. It was all a muddle and couldn't stand up to a determined and single-minded enemy in the form of the Taliban. Operational art is that bit of military activity that knits together the end state at the top with the tactics and procedures of the battles at the bottom. It is a wicked test of a commander's judgment. Think of the military as an orchestra. Now, each individual musician may be well on top of his or her game, but when they're tuning up, the whole thing sounds like an absolute mess. Once the conductor calls the ensemble to order, this cacophony of noise has the potential to be transformed into a powerful and overwhelming thing of beauty. So it is with operational art. Like a conductor standing in front of an orchestra, a military commander has to balance a whole host of competing demands. Whilst the tanks may be fully fueled and ready to go, the artillery might still be waiting for ammunition. The engineers haven't finished training on their new bridge laying equipment. The infantry are exhausted from their last effort and the air force haven't yet settled their hotel bills. All in all, the pieces just aren't ready to go yet as a coherent force. However, it is to invite disaster to commit men and women to combat by hoping they'll sort it all out on the ground or by giving in to the demands to do something through sheer frustration. There's quite a lot of frustration regarding the war in Ukraine right now, with some observers, usually those who don't really know what they're talking about, questioning why Ukraine hasn't defeated Russia yet, seeing as the counteroffensive was launched in June. Well, let's go back to the orchestra. Even if all the musicians are on top form, they've tuned up and practiced with the other elements, getting them all to blow, pluck, fiddle and drum at the same time makes for a very obvious and unwelcome spectacle. It's all in the timing and the relative priorities given to one element over another. It's the same with military campaigns. You don't want it all fortissimo, very loud, a little pianissimo, very soft. Now and again can work wonders for the piece as a whole. So what's to be done? Well. First, a commander needs to have a thorough understanding of the states of readiness of the forces under his or her command. Where are they, for starters? How combat effective are they, i.e. how close to what they should be on paper are they in reality, having had a few scrapes with the enemy? Have they got full stocks of fuel, ammunition, food and water? Next, the commander needs an intuitive feel for the military intangibles. Which unit has the higher morale? That one? that's just taken an absolute pounding, but has an energetic, 
charismatic and well-liked boss, or that one that has taken far fewer casualties but doesn't seem to gel for some reason? Are they fighting for each other or for glory? And if the latter, does that mean they'll buckle when things get really tough? So that's the commander's own force. Next, what about the enemy? The same questions of size, strength and morale have to be asked, of course, but laid on top of all those considerations are others. First, and we've discussed this before on Defence in Depth, the commander has to decide what the enemy's centre of gravity is, that single element that, if threatened or destroyed, can cause the whole enemy effort to collapse. So centre of gravity could be an individual, like, for example, Bashar al-Assad in Syria, or a military formation like Saddam Hussein's Republican Guard, or other nebulous concepts such as domestic support, which arguably unpicked the US in Vietnam and the coalition in Afghanistan. Centre of gravity analysis is probably the most important area for the commander and staff to put their intellectual effort into and spend most of their time on. Get it right, and the ensuing plans are coherent and mutually supporting. Get it wrong though, and a lot of effort is spent and lives lost chasing a dream. The commander will then decide upon lines of operation, specific plans for different types of military activity, on the ground, in the air, missile strikes on, say, the Black Sea Fleet headquarters in Crimea, just as drones hit Moscow, and irregular forces or partisans blow up railway lines in Melitopol. Specific objectives along each of these lines of operation will be identified, some big, some small, all vital to be achieved at the right times in relation to each other if the whole campaign is to be kept on track. Each line should be mutually supporting and all must lead towards the centre of gravity, even the bits that are there as deceptions. If they don't lead inexorably to the centre of gravity, they're a waste of time and lives and need to be ditched. The commander has to keep all of that understood under control and under constant review because things will go wrong and the pesky enemy will interfere with your beautifully constructed plans. Even if it all goes well, the poor old commander will likely have to fight for his or her legacy because, you see, whilst failure is an orphan, success has many fathers. So when we look at the war in Ukraine, we could say it's all a waste of time. Zelensky's troops are bogged down in the south and are firing missiles at ships in the Black Sea just to get a good news headline. Or maybe the power and speed of modern media, including social media, means we're looking at this war through drinking straws, observing and commenting in great detail about different elements of different lines of activity that might actually be working in concert with each other, albeit imperfectly, the enemy gets a vote, remember? towards the same end state. It's all a matter of perspective and sometimes we need to step back, look and read more widely and engage brain before opening mouth. Defence In Depth is a weekly video output by The Telegraph of the big defence stories. If you'd like a daily fix of content about the war in Ukraine, I'd suggest Ukraine The Latest, The Telegraph's podcast. For more defence stories, we've left links in the description below, and if you have a topic you'd like us to cover, let us know in the comments. Please do visit our website for the latest updates, news and analysis, or failing that, you can read the paper. <laughs>